Erev Tov, and that will be the last of the Hebrew for a while. Um, my name is Shalom Abar Banel, and I'm a mathematician. I've introduced Professor Bernard Lewis before, and it's a very difficult task for two main reasons, especially in this hall. One, he's been here consecutively now, how many years? 20? More, more than that, 25 years. And the introducers, I think, have exhausted the lore and his CV and everything you can say about him. Secondly, to compound it, I see many familiar faces in the audience. I think that this is a loyal audience, and therefore many of you have heard many of the introductions. So I've decided to do something else. I will tell you three short vignettes, which I hope will demonstrate his wit, his fame, and last but not lastly, but and not least, that he's a mensch. Star not necessarily chronologically and so on. In two of the vignettes, the stories that I will tell are true because I was present. One of them has been making the rounds and if you will deny that it took place, it doesn't matter because mythology is stronger than truth. <laughs> so let me try start with the vignette of, of wit. Uh, apparently, this was this very large conference in the United States and as very often the case, Professor Bernard Lewis was the keynote speaker, and he gave one of his very good lectures about the topic that he knows best. And this was long enough ago that it was not yet really fashionable to, to attack Orientalism. Some people did, you know, Edward Said started some of it, although he was a Christian. But at the end of the lecture, some young men got up and said, how dare you, one who is not a Muslim, who is not an Arab, talk about studying and research about Islam. Islam should be, and the Arabs should be studied by Arabs, by people, by Muslims. And Professor Bernard Lewis, without missing a heartbeat, said to him, well, if I understood, understood you correctly, marine biology should be done by fish. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's number one. The second vignette, call it the vignette of fame, took place many years ago in one of his first visits, I think, in Israel. And there was a party for him, I think in Joel Kramer's home in Erzaliya, a long time ago. And uh, Professor Lewis had to make a phone call to the United States. Well, those were the days when, first of all, phone calls were very expensive. And Israeli academics were making very little money. So Professor Lewis didn't want to burden uh, Joel Kramer with the bill for the phone call. So he said, let's make it a collect call, in Hebrew, guvaina. And so the host said, fine. And he picked up the phone and he called the operator. And he said to the operator, I would like to place a collect call to Princeton, New Jersey, the number is such, such and such. So the operator said, what's the name of the party that you would like to call? And he said, well, the name of the party that you'd like to call is such and such. 
who will be making the call? You need to know. And he said, either Professor Bernard Lewis or Bernard Lewis, whatever it is. And the operator said, you mean, oh, the one that wrote the Arabs in history. <laughs> so I was there. And now I come to the last vignette. I'm running over my time. This was about, well, exactly almost 16 years ago. Uh, Professor Bernard Lewis, as usual, was visiting us at the same time every year. And I guess to greet him, we had some scuds falling around. And uh, again, there was a get-together in his honor. And that one was a thing in Sasson Somer's place. And after the party, uh, actually we quit fairly early because there were no scuds yet that evening. And we were afraid, you know, any time they could have the daily dose. So it was suggested that we leave early. And I was volunteered, or I volunteered to drive Professor Lewis back to his place. And as we were driving, just to make conversation, I said something like, well, you know, we could be having some scuds falling and being in the open, it wouldn't be very pleasant. And he said, yes, it wouldn't, would it? <laughs> and that's it. And you have to remember that we had many guests at that time, not just at Tel Aviv, other places, who did not stay throughout the war. So it's my pleasure to present a famous wit and a mensch, Professor Bernard Lewis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for um, <clears throat> uh, an entirely new experience in being introduced. <laughs> and uh, in my long life, that has not happened to me before, and I'm most grateful to you. And I can commend you also for the accuracy of your narratives. <laughs> As you were told, I've been coming here for many, many years. And this is beginning to present a problem. After 20 odd years to find new subjects every year is um, becoming an increasingly difficult assignment. In any other place, I would simply regurgitate some of the old stuff but here people have long memories, <laughs> and that is, to say the very least, unsafe. Fortunately, what does make things a little easier in this respect is the constant changes that are taking place in the region, the study of which is my special concern. So although I am dealing with old topics and well-established institutions, I hope I may be able to find if not new facts, at least perhaps some new insights. Last week I overran my time. I must make sure I don't this time. Yes. Um, the title is Islam, the West, and the Jews. Now that's a very odd assortment, you may say. A religion, a compass point and a group of people who are variously defined in various ways by themselves and others. Well, I would <clears throat> like to begin by suggesting that the three are essentially of the same type and are closely linked, not only in history but also in their own perceptions and self-perceptions. Islam is a religion, and uh, here I will permit myself a brief repetition. As I have pointed out on earlier occasions, and I think it's an important point, the word Islam is used in two distinct but related senses, as the equivalent of Christianity and as the equivalent of Christendom. That's to say, not just a religion in the sense of a pattern of belief and worship, but also of the whole civilization that grew up under the aegis of that religion. And it is in that sense that I shall be speaking of Islam this evening. The West is the latest of a series of names by which what used to be called Christendom now calls itself. 
Um, religious designations are no longer acceptable in the Western world. They cause, to say the very least, unease, discomfort. Um, for a while we called ourselves the free world uh, in order to stress the difference between our superior institutions and those of the unfree who constituted the rest of the world. And that is no longer acceptable since in principle everybody is free. And as to the facts, we don't look too closely. And uh, the term that is now generally accepted is the West, a word of multiple meanings. Uh, when I first went to take up a visiting appointment at UCLA in Los Angeles, I was astonished to discover that the West was actually the East. <laughs> Places to the East of California. And uh, that's a different sense of the West, and it's not the one in which I'm using it this evening. By the West, I mean what has variously been called the Christian and more recently the post-Christian world, primarily Europe, I should say originally Europe and then the extensions of Europe in various directions, notably into the American continent, north and south. As to the Jews, well, in this place and to this audience, I don't think I need to go into any detail elaborating what that word means. All three groups, though not equally, have a certain self-perception in which there are very important elements that are shared. All three are in some degree aware of the fact that there are links between them going back very far, that there is a connection between them, quite different from anything that exists between the West, however we define it, and the other Orient, India, China, the rest. Um, the German Orientalist Karl Heinrich Becker once remarked, I think very aptly, he says, we are accustomed to draw the dividing line between East and West on the border between Christendom and Islam. He said, that's wrong. Christendom and Islam both belong in the same camp. The real border between East and West, between Occident and Orient, is on the eastern border of Islam between the Islamic world and those other civilizations further east, notably, as I remarked a moment ago, those of India and China. Within this group of three, um, there is a continuing relationship from the earliest times to the present day, and certain common features which have made intercommunication possible even at the times of the most violent conflict and hatred. In the West, it is now customary to speak of the Judeo-Christian tradition. The term is modern. In earlier times, it would have been found equally objectionable on both sides of the hyphen. But it, although the term is modern, the reality is old. It goes back a long way. There is indeed an intimate relationship between the Christian and Jewish religions and religious cultures, beginning, of course, with the Bible, with the Jewish Bible, which the Christians renamed the Old Testament when they added a New Testament to it. But the Old Testament is still part of the Christian tradition, has played an enormous role in the formation of Christian civilization, in all its different aspects. There are some other characteristics, but I'll come back to that in a moment. Um, one could, I think, also speak with equal justification of a Judeo-Islamic tradition. One doesn't, of course, and insofar as it did exist, it has now come to an end. The relationship between Judaism and Islam is different from the relationship between Judaism and Christianity. The Quran does not come as a third testament to be added to the other two. It comes as a new and final revelation to replace the other two. If I may digress for a moment to explain that. <coughs> <coughs> 
Biblical figures and biblical stories from both the Old and the New Testaments figure prominently in the Quranic narrative, but often with significant differences. Now, a Jew or a Christian looking at the Quranic treatment of biblical figures and incidents will simply say, oh well, he got it wrong, or his informants got it wrong. For a Muslim, that is, of course, that explanation is a blasphemous absurdity. God does not get it wrong. God's prophet is not misinformed. If the biblical version of biblical characters and events differs from the Quranic version of biblical characters and events, it must be because the Jews and Christians distorted their scriptures. Hence the need for a new and final scripture to replace them. Nevertheless, in spite of that, there are certain very important features which I think we can justly designate with the term Judeo-Islamic tradition. And I'm thinking notably of the role of law as perceived by both Jews and Muslims, divine law, regulating every aspect of life. Um, the Arabic word Sharia and the Hebrew word Halakha both mean the same thing. They have the literal meaning of a pathway going towards something. Uh, both, curiously, originate in the same place, in Iraq, though the Muslim one some centuries later. And both are concerned with very much the same things and use the same kinds of arguments. Um, when the first Muslim students were sent by their governments to European universities at the beginning of the 19th century, they were told that they must not in any circumstances eat Christian food, but they were allowed to eat Jewish food, as the Jews do observe certain rules, whereas the Christians will eat or drink anything. This common feature of Judaism and Christianity and Islam is, I think, an extremely important one. And in the past, it was an important element of, shall we say, communication, and even of kinship between the two. For a large part of the recorded history, um, Judaism was on the whole rather closer to the Islamic world than to the Christian world. And until the 17th century, approximately, Jews were much better treated in the Islamic world than in the Christian world. After that, things began to change. But we'll come back to that. As a Judeo-Christian, Judeo-Islamic, what about a linkage between the Christian and Islamic traditions? Is there a thing which we might call a Christian-Islamic tradition? I would say yes, there is, because there is one very important feature that these two religions have in common, which is not shared by the Jews or, as far as I am aware, by any other religion on earth. The belief that they are the fortunate recipients of God's final message to humanity, which it is their duty to bring to the rest of humanity, removing whatever obstacles there may be on the way in order to bring universal enlightenment and, of course, incidentally, the universal domination of their own faith and community. This is sometimes known as triumphalism by those who dislike it, just as the more Jewish approach, Hindu approach, is known as relativism by those notably in the churches who condemn it. This triumphalist attitude, which is shared by Muslims and Christians, is again an important resemblance between these two, and made possible communication between them, even at the most violent times of conflict, perhaps especially at the most violent times of conflict. Here we have then three religious traditions, linked, consecutive, adjacent, brought into conflict more by their resemblances than by their differences.
Christianity and Islam became major civilizations and major powers, world powers. Judaism, after the ending of the ancient Jewish polity, Judaism was a component in these two, in both the one and the other. It's interesting that if we look through Jewish history during the two millennia of the diaspora, it is almost entirely in Christian or in Muslim lands. There were small groups of Jews who settled in India and China, but they never amounted to anything, either in Jewish history or in the history of those countries. They were meaning no disrespect of little significance. It's interesting that it seems that Judaism could only flourish under Christian or Muslim rule, even when that rule was hostile and even when those governments persecuted them. I think it's, it's better to be persecuted than to be utterly insignificant. <laughs> it's curious that if you look at this long ongoing conflict between the two world religions, the two triumphalist religions, Christianity and Islam, there are remarkable resemblances even in their manner of waging war against one another. For example, for a long time, each refused to recognize the other, even as a religion. If you look at the long record of the wars between Christendom and Islam, starting in the 7th century and continuing until we don't yet know when, if you look at the long record, for a long time, Christian writings do not refer to the enemy who is invading Christendom as Muslims or anything like that. They use either the general term unbelievers or infidels, or if they need to be more specific, they use ethnic terms. They call them Saracens or Moors or Tatars or whichever particular group of Muslims they encountered. In Spain, it was Moors. In Russia, it was Tatars, and so on. And it's curious that this ethnic designation continues even when they're talking about strictly religious matters. For example, in Shakespeare's day, if a Christian was converted to Islam, he was said to have turned Turk. Which, on the face of it, is absurd, but this was how these terms were used. If we look to the other side, to the Muslim side, we find the same phenomenon. They do not normally describe the opponent as Christians. They describe him as infidels, kafara, unbelievers, or else they use ethnic terms. They call them Greeks, Romans, Franks, Slavs, etc. It isn't until comparatively late, uh, with a somewhat higher level of, shall we say, intellectual sophistication, that they begin to use religious designations to describe religions other than their own, a marked step towards tolerance. And then they still use terms which are both inaccurate and demeaning. In the Christian world, the term that for a long time was generally used was Mohammedanism. Muslims were called Mohammedans, and the faith was called Mohammedanism implying that it was some sort of cult started by a man called Muhammad. <laughs> Muslims do not call themselves Mohammedans. They have never done so. And they are understandably offended by the use of this designation. If we look on the other side, it's no better. They called Christians Nasrani, people from Nazareth. Again, the implication of a local cult, the followers of that Rabbi from Nazareth. It isn't until comparatively recently that the terms Muslim and Islam have passed into general use in Western language and that the term Masihi and its equivalent, Masihi being a literal <coughs> translation of Christian into Arabic, have passed into use on that side. <coughs> <coughs> I'm sorry.
In the West, things became more complicated when the simple religious designation, which defined both identity and loyalty, began to give way to others, to such things as nationality and ethnicity, um, country, nation, and the like. Um, this created a new problem of understanding, or rather misunderstanding, between the two sides. Because while the Islamic world was aware of ethnic identity, while it did have a natural affection for the place, the country where one was born and lived, these were not definitions of political identity or loyalty. And it took a little while before communication, meaningful communication, was possible between the two on this level. Um, eventually, of course, um, the idea of country and nation crossed from Christendom into the Islamic world where they have had an enormous impact in our own day. The war between the two begins almost with the advent of Islam. Um, Islam was not a local cult. It was not intended just to bring their own version. There are passages in the Quran which seem to imply this, but they have not been understood or interpreted in that sense. Um, if you, I'm sure that everybody in this room has been to the Dome of the Rock, you've all seen the inscription inside, uh, which says very clearly, God is one, he has no companion, he does not beget, he is not begotten. A clear declaration of war against a central dogma of the Christian religion. Um, the Caliph at the same time struck gold coins, a breach of Roman copyright. Until then only the Romans and the Byzantines after them had struck gold coins. And this was a sort of world recognized privilege. The Caliph struck his own gold coins and put the same inscriptions on them. A clear declaration of war, saying in effect to the Byzantine Emperor, your religion is superseded, your scriptures are corrupted, your time has passed, move over, we are taking over the world. And that was the beginning of this long struggle, which in various forms has continued <coughs> ever since. It came in several phases. <clears throat> the first is the Arab phase, when the Arabs came out of the Arabian Peninsula, who were previously alone, they had lived and conquered vast territories eastward from the emperors of Iran and beyond, more important for our present purpose, westward, where they conquered what were then the Christian countries, Syria, Palestine, Egypt, North Africa, and went beyond into Europe conquering Spain, Portugal, and a large piece of southern Italy, including the whole of Sicily. A little later, the Tatars of the Golden Horde, who were not themselves Muslims originally, but were converted to Islam, conquered Russia and established an Islamic regime in Eastern Europe, which was also advancing westwards towards Poland, while the Arabs in Spain and Sicily were advancing northwards into France. We even hear of a raid, of, um, <coughs> an Arab raid into Switzerland, the purpose of which is not quite clear. Perhaps they wanted to open bank accounts, I don't know. <laughs> the attempt to conquer Europe this time failed. There was what is known in Spanish history as the Reconquista, the reconquest the recovery of Spain and Portugal and Sicily from its Moorish conquerors, to use the terminology of the time, but it was not possible to recover North Africa. North Africa had also been part of Christendom. This time it remained and still remains part of Islam. <coughs> Uh, 
The attempt was not limited to the reconquest of Western Europe. There was also an attempt <clears throat> to reconquer the Holy Land, the place where we are sitting, talking now. Um, for Christians, of course, this had a special importance. This was where Jesus was born and lived and died, where the foundations of their faith were laid. It has the same importance for Christians as Mecca and Medina do for Muslims. And Muslims have been more fortunate in that their holy cities and their holy land have never suffered alien or infidel occupation. For Christians and Jews, that was not, not true. And on the contrary, the Christian Jewish holy land was conquered and occupied. The Crusades represent an attempt to recover the Christian holy land and the Christian holy places. The discussion of the Crusades nowadays is an interesting example of the reshaping, re retelling of history at the present time in terms of political correctness, multiculturalism and the rest. We have even seen the spectacle of a Pope apologizing to the Muslims for the Crusades. Now, I have no desire to serve as an apologist for the Crusaders. Their cruelty and brutality, not only against Muslims, but also against Jews, and even against Eastern Christians, anybody with a beard, in fact, uh, is well known. But to describe this, as it is nowadays described, as a wanton, unprovoked attack on a peaceful, inoffensive neighbor, is just preposterous. Um, Let's look back a bit. In the year 846, that is some time before the Crusades, in the year 846, the Arabs, having conquered North Africa, Sicily, a good piece of mainland Italy in the south, raided Rome. A naval expedition seized the port of Ostia, went into Rome, sacked St. Peter's, and then left. The Pope of the time, Leo IV, proclaimed a crusade. Um, a little later, his successor, John VIII, <coughs> offered divine rewards to those who perished in this crusade to save Christendom from the attackers. Um, the immediate provocation of the crusades was a change in the power, the ruling powers in the Holy Land and serious obstacles placed in the way of Christian pilgrims visiting their sacred places. One might, I think, actually, uh, oh yes, one other rather interesting feature, that in the crusade propaganda, which was put out by at least two popes and by various other Christian leaders, in the propaganda calling people to join in the crusade, they talk a great deal about the rewards which the crusaders will earn in the afterlife. It seems that they had been studying the enemy, which is always a useful thing to do in wartime, and were adapting some of the enemy methods to their own purposes. It didn't work, as you know. The crusades failed. The crusaders were driven out of the Holy Land and adjoining areas. And although the reconquest of Europe was completed in the West, the, the rest remained under Muslim rule. And uh, the best that one can say about the Crusades is that they represented <coughs> a late, limited, and ineffectual attempt to imitate the Jihad. Even to the extent of offering similar rewards. This kind of, how shall I put it, self-abasement, which characterizes a good deal of modern writing about the subject, has gone very far indeed into many other things. And uh, it's sometimes difficult to see where it will stop.
The second phase is that of the Ottoman Turks. Not Arabs, but Turks, but certainly Muslims, who created a new state which grew into a new empire, which resumed the attack on Christendom. The Arabs have tried several times to capture the Christian city of Constantinople. They failed. The Turks succeeded and were able to cross into southeastern Europe, almost the whole of which came under Muslim rule and became part of the Muslim Ottoman Empire. The <clears throat> the Turks advanced twice as far as Vienna, twice tried to capture Vienna and failed. And the second failure marked the end of their advance into Europe and the beginning of the second European counterattack, an equivalent of the Spanish Reconquista. Now here I would remind you that the, the, the Islamic advance into Europe at that time was not limited to Eastern Europe. You have the Barbary Corsairs based in North Africa who were conducting what in their perspective was a maritime jihad against the countries of Western Christendom, uh, Spain, France, the British Isles, even Iceland and Madeira on some of their more extensive raids. But that too came to an end. And here we come to the second phase of reconquest. Here I would like to quote an Ottoman historian, a certain Mustafa Selaniki Efendi. He was the the Vakanuvis, the Ottoman title, which literally means event writer. It was the practice of the Ottoman court for the Sultan to appoint an event writer whose duty was to keep a record of major historical events, to keep a record of them and in due course compile them into books. At a certain date in 1593, Selaniki Mustafa Effendi records the arrival of an English ambassador in Istanbul. English, of course, this was before the Act of Union. Not a British, an English ambassador. He tells us nothing about the ambassador. He doesn't tell us his name. He doesn't tell us his mission or anything that he did. He makes only two points about the English ambassador who came to Istanbul in 1593. The first is the ship on which he arrived. He looked at this ship in wonderment. He said, this is a ship which travels 13,700 miles and has 83 guns. Obviously, this is, these are not round figures. He counted them. If they'd been round figures, he might have said 80 or 90. He wouldn't have said 83. I think you'll agree. Um, he, was in normal, he said, a ship like this has never been seen before in our waters. He was right. This was a ship built for the Atlantic and was capable of traveling from England all the way around Western Europe through the Straits of Gibraltar into the Mediterranean and right across the Mediterranean to Istanbul. He was right. His historic sense was acute and accurate. Um, this was one of the major features which gave rise to the predominance of Western power, and not only in the Middle East, but all over Asia. The, the Atlantic ship, which was swifter, safer, cheaper, and much more efficient, both for com commerce and for war. And thanks to these ships, even small European powers like Holland and Portugal were able to acquire and rule vast empires in Asia. Selaniki Mustafa Effendi mentions a second remarkable point about the ambassador. That is the ruler who appointed him and whom he represents. And Mustafa Effendi says with 
visible, palpable astonishment. You can actually read it in the text without too much difficulty. He says, the ruler who sent this ambassador is a woman. Elizabeth, of course, who governs her inherited realm with full authority. Women rulers were not entirely unknown, but they were certainly exceptional and strongly disapproved. And um, I think Selanike was right. I think his historical instincts were sound again in seeing this again as a major difference between the Western world and his own. The position of women in Christendom in the 16th century and for a long time after that was very far from one of equality. But at its worst, it was incomparably better than the position of women in the Islamic world. And it enabled them to play a part of increasing importance in the conduct of affairs and also an aspect to which Turkish writers later drew attention, also in the upbringing even of the males of the next generation. Um, uh, a 19th century Turkish writer, now Kemal, actually goes so far as to see in the treatment of women the main reason for the backwardness and weakness of the Islamic world as compared with the wealth and power and progress of the West. He says, we, by depriving ourselves of the talents and services of half the population and submitting even the male half to early education by downtrodden and ignorant women, we are depriving ourselves and our, our society compared with the West resembles a human body that is paralyzed on one side. I think a striking, and I think you will agree, an accurate image. Selaniki, I think, Selaniki Mustafa Avendi got it right. And there is no doubt that from that time onwards, from the 16th century onwards, the maritime states of the West begin to grow in power and advance around Africa, across the Atlantic, and uh, into almost the whole of the rest of the world. This phase of the Christian reconquest and expansion has come to be known as imperialism. What exactly does that mean? Imperialism, racism, sexism, these are all Western words, of course, and fairly modern ones. This does not mean that the offenses which they designate are Western innovations. Far from it. All of them were present in every society, every group known to human history, in one form or another. What it means is that in the West, they were first recognized as offenses. And in the West, the first efforts were made to deal with them, to correct them. Nevertheless, during this long period of Western domination, um, a bitter struggle developed between East and West. It took a new form. And has continued, though no longer in a military form, to the present day. So, the first invasion of Europe by Islam, the Arab one, or was halted and reversed. The second invasion of Europe by Islam, the Ottoman one, was halted and reversed. We come now to the third invasion, that which is going on at the present time. Not by armed conquest, not by migrating hordes, but by simple immigration, a combination on the one side of migration and demography, on the other side of self-denigration and self-abasement. Totally apologetic at every phase. Leading uh, in a direction which uh, I think was defined very well by a recent Syrian writer who says, there is only one question about the future of Europe. Will it be 
a Christianized Europe or will it be a Europeanized Islam? The answer to that question is not yet clear. But I think there is a third possibility, a very alarming one, and that is that it leads to a long, dreary race war between different communities in Europe. There are signs of that already visible in some of the, what shall I call them, neo-fascist, racist types of movements. If that is going to be the only response of Europe, apart from self-abasement, then the outlook is grim. Let me say a word about tolerance. A good deal has been said and written about tolerance and intolerance. Much of it, though not all of it, nonsense. In the past, I think there can be no reasonable doubt that the Islamic world was far more tolerant than the Christian world. In both senses of the world, by the test of their attitude to followers of other religions, <coughs> and by the more searching test of their attitude to divergent forms of their own religion. Um, there is nothing in Islamic history to resemble the the, the terrible wars of Protestants and Catholics, the persecutions, the inquisitions, the expulsions, and the rest. Until, shall we say, the 17th century, there could be no doubt that the Muslim world was far more tolerant in every respect. This is no longer true. Now it's, I think, the other way around. And particularly uh, at the present moment when the conflict between Sunni and Shia has acquired a new acuteness. It has become more violent than at any time in the recorded history of Islam. Yes, there were conflicts between them in the past, but usually the motivation was something other than religion. We find, for example, when, during the period when the domination of the Middle East was contested between the Ottoman sultans of Turkey and the Safavid Shahs of Iran, one group was Sunni, the other group was Shia. And the Sunni-Shia rivalry was, so to speak, an aspect of the conflict between two rival empires competing for the domination of the region. Um, now it is acquiring something very different, much more distinctly religious, and therefore much more dangerous. Let me turn now to the varying position of Jews in these situations. I don't think there can be any doubt at the present time that the long and in many respects remarkable history of the Judeo-Islamic tradition, the history of the Jews in Muslim countries, <coughs> has come to an end. Anti-Semitism, which was previously an exclusively Christian phenomenon, has now been adopted and internalized in the Islamic world. Let me explain what I mean by anti-Semitism. Uh, it is perfectly possible to hate and even persecute Jews without being anti-Semitic. That may sound absurd to you. What I mean is that hatred and persecution of people who are different is part of the normal human condition. It has always been like that everywhere at all times. But anti-Semitism has something peculiar and special about it, attributing to Jews a quality of cosmic evil, of universal evil. That was unknown in the Islamic world until fairly modern times, when it was imported from Europe, from Christendom. And it has now become prevalent to a remarkable degree. Um, what prospects are there? Let me conclude my remarks by trying to say a few words about the changes that have taken place. I begin with the bad ones, which will give me the opportunity to end with the good ones. It's always more satisfactory, though I'll be briefer. 
And the third I've already mentioned, the spread and dominance of Western-style anti-Semitism of the crudest type. The protocols, the blood libel, everything, now have a central role in many Muslim countries. You find them in textbooks, in school books, in university doctoral dissertations even, and of course in radio and television at home all the time. This gives a, a new and even a more deadly significance to the fact that some of these societies are acquiring or will soon acquire deadly weapons. Weapons with a destructive power beyond Hitler's wildest dreams. And that again I think is something that we should be very concerned about. And the third, linked with the first two, is what I described in my other talk briefly as the apocalyptic vision that now prevails in some Islamic circles. The idea that we are now at the end of time and that uh, the final battles between the forces of good and the forces of evil uh, are about to begin. I think those are the main harmful consequences of these changes that have taken place. Are there any good ones? Here I shall be very cautious. The first is signs of a certain realignment of preferences and alliances in the Middle Eastern region. It will not have escaped your attention that during the recent war in Lebanon, the Israelis were being discreetly cheered by many Sunni Muslim governments in the hope that they would finish the job. Those governments were very disappointed with the outcome of the war. Um, I would remind you of the uh, why Sadat decided at the time to make peace with Israel. And it was not that Sadat was suddenly convinced of the merits of Zionism or, or, or converted to a pro-Jewish view, nothing of the kind. Sadat looked around and decided that he faced a greater danger than Israel, namely the Soviet Union. I was in Egypt at the end of the war in 45. I went home when the war ended. I didn't go back to Egypt until 69. But after that I went very frequently from 69 onwards. And the Soviet presence was palpable. Um, it was becoming rather like the British occupation in the old days uh, with garrisons and forbidden zones and the like. And Egyptians were palpably resentful of this. Um, I remember going to visit um, Luxor, chatting with an Egyptian shopkeeper, and he was lamenting the fact that they were no longer getting the European and American tourists. And they said that you're getting plenty of Russians. And he spat eloquently into the gutter and said, the Russians, he said, they won't give you a cigarette and they won't buy a packet of cigarettes. I think that put it very nicely. And resentment was already growing. There were whole areas in Egypt to which no Egyptian was permitted to enter. The resemblance to the British occupation, but without British politeness, <laughs> was palpable. And clearly, Sadat had come to realize that the independence of Egypt was seriously threatened. And that was why he took the very brave step of ordering a number of Soviet um, specialists, as they were called, out of the country. He took the risk that the Russians might do what they did in Hungary or Czechoslovakia. They decided that they couldn't do that across the waters. He got away with it. He was then hoping for some support from Washington. And what he got was the Vance Kromicko Agreement, uh, which seemed to be an agreement uh, to leave Egypt to the Russians as part of their sphere of influence. 
It was then that he decided to turn to Israel on the best estimate of Israel's power and on the worst estimate of Israel's intentions. Israel did not really represent a danger to Egypt, certainly nothing remotely comparable with the Soviet Union. I think one may see something similar at the present time. In fact, I, I, I think I know that there are people who are thinking and even speaking along similar lines at the present time. They may dislike Israel, they may disapprove of Israel, they may think that Israel is unjustified, but a Shiite revolution extending in an uninterrupted line from Iran across Iraq and Syria to Lebanon threatening the Arabian Peninsula from the large and growing Shiite populations around the coast of Arabia. This represents a truly major threat. And this is leading more and more people in Arab governments, not so much among Arab populations, but among Arab governments, to have a different look at the question of what Israel is about and what their relationship with Israel should be. Um, so far, they are very cautious about it, for obvious reasons, partly because of their own populations, who have been indoctrinated with hatred of Israel for so long that it's rather difficult to switch tunes, but partly also <coughs> because of some uncertainty as to how far they can trust the Israelis. Um, as I said, the war in Lebanon was a great disappointment. But the possibility exists, and I think we may, I stress the word may, we may see shifts in the policies of some Arab governments at least, comparable with the great shift in Egyptian policy that was inaugurated by Sadat when he offered to go to Jerusalem and went. The other sign of possible hope, and this one is even more tenuous, is the growing appreciation, and this I have found in surprising places, of what Israel is about. The argument for democracy, the argument about democracy has been going on for a long time now. There has been too much of an obsession with elections. I think people have tended to forget that a free election is the culmination not the inauguration of a process of democratization. But there are other aspects. I have often sat in, in Jordan especially with friends looking at Israeli television and I would be just being impressed by the wonderment with which they contemplate free debate. They get plenty of different points of view if they tune into different stations. And there are now carefully orchestrated debates on Al Jazeera and so on. But what they can see on Israeli television is something that they see nowhere else. They can see a freely elected member of parliament denouncing his government, its members, its policies and all that they do, and then going home safely to prepare his next tirade for the following day, and see this reported on Israeli national television. This is looked at with utter wonderment. And I think there are with signs, with the beginning of appreciation of how a working democracy actually functions and a desire to achieve something of the same sort themselves. As I say, this is still very tenuous, very limited. Uh, I don't know how far it will go, but it does enable me to end my remarks on a note of very cautious hope. Thank you.
Israel or Jewish presentation. Uh, do you see if this is a new thing? Do you see that as a big change? Could it lead to big changes? I must, I must plead ignorance on this subject. I have been to India a couple of times, but my acquaintance with Hindu civilization is very limited. Certainly, as you know, there was a Jewish community. There was more than one in India at different times. But they atrophied. They never, they never made any significant contribution to Indian public life, um, nor until they came here to Jewish life. They just didn't seem to function in that environment. And the same is true to an even greater extent of the Jews in China. I remember meeting a Chinese scholar, um, a member of the Academy of Sciences in Beijing, who told me at one point that he was a descendant of the former Jewish community in China. And I asked him what he knew of Judaism, and he answered in four words, one, one God, no pork. Talk. Um, you Sorry? mentioned. I can't hear you. Thank you for your talk. You mentioned that uh, the Islam referred to the Christians as infidels. How did they refer to Christians that were within their their realm? Did they also refer to the Christian, the Arab Christians as infidels, or did, what was the word that they used? Oh yes, the Christians are infidels, whether they're Arabs or not. I mean, it was religious identity that mattered. Um, they never used the term Arab Christians, that is a modern term. Um, they were simply Christians, they were members of the Christian minority. Um, there was a, may I take this opportunity to add something which I didn't have time for before? <laughs> this question of religious minority communities. There's a very great difference between the notion of tolerance as practiced in the Muslim states and as experienced by Muslim minorities now in the Western world. Um, for example, <clears throat> in the Ottoman Empire, the, the non-Muslim communities were constituted millets. They were subject to certain disabilities. Um, for example, the payment of the poll tax. On the other hand, they had almost complete autonomy in their internal affairs. Um, they could live according to their own laws. The Jewish community lived according to Jewish laws in marriage, inheritance, and many other things. And the, uh, the rabbinical authorities could enforce them. The same was true of the Christians. So that three people living in the same street, a Christian, a Jew, and a Muslim, would be judged by different laws, subject to different authorities, though part of the same state. Um, this, of course, is not the case among the Muslim communities in Europe. So while on the one hand they are getting a degree of tolerance without parallel in Islamic history, on the other hand they are not getting the kind of tolerance which was routinely accorded to non-Muslim minorities in the Muslim states. It was put in a rather comic form by uh, one Muslim friend of mine in Germany who said, we allowed you to enforce monogamy why shouldn't you allow us to practice polygamy? <laughs> yes, um, given, given Israel's position uh, in this evolving conflict between the Sunnis and the Shiites, would you please comment on the possibility of Israel forming a peace alliance with Syria, given that the Alawites who currently rule Syria are Shiite and not Sunni? Are you suggesting an Israeli Shiite alliance? Uh, yes, that's what I'm. No, no, other way around. Uh, an Israeli Sunni alliance that's developing, yeah, yeah. but the possibility of turning Syria, given the fact that they're currently ruled yes. by well, the Alawites who are Shiite. The Alawites are a Shiite minority. I mean, they are a heresy within a heresy, so to speak. But um, Syria has become increasingly uh, an Iranian dependency controlled from Iran. And uh, I think we have to take that into account in devising a policy towards Syria. I won't be more specific than that. And I 
I'm wondering if that is a really authentic letter and if there are other letters that were written by the Prophet Muhammad that we know about. Uh, there, there is a letter purporting to have been written by the Prophet addressed to the Emperor of Constantinople, to the Sassanid Shah, to the Negus of Ethiopia and various other infidel rulers, informing them of his advent and of his new mission and summoning them to adopt his faith. Uh, the general view among scholars is that these documents are not authentic, that they are a later fabrication. In the past. That's a very large question. <clears throat> First, a word about the status of the Dhimmi. A good deal has been said and written of late about Dhimmi and Dhimmitude, as someone has called it. Um, I'd like to make one thing clear. Um, Dhimmitude is not tolerance in the sense of complete equality of treatment. It is tolerance in a more traditional sense. What does tolerance mean? Tolerance means I am the boss. I will allow you some, though not all, of the rights which I enjoy as long as you behave yourself according to rules which I will enforce. I think that's a fair description of what tolerance means. In, in that sense, the Dhimmi status, as I said before, was vastly more tolerant than anything that was available in Christendom to Jews or to deviant Christians. But it is not certainly full tolerance and equality in the modern sense of the word. And um, if there is really to be a modern democratic order, then something would have to be changed. Uh, this is, of course, the position not only for Jews, but also, much more importantly, for Christians, of whom there are still, despite serious erosion, there are still considerable numbers in Muslim countries. The same question arises in a more acute form for them. If you look at the Ottoman records, for example, the Jews and, Jews and Muslims in principle were equal. They were just dimmi communities. In fact, the Ottomans treated the Jews much better because they didn't regard them as dangerous. Christians were dangerous, the Jews were not. And there are even customs regulations in which the rate of payment is determined not by the merchandise, but by the merchant. And there are three rates the lowest one for Muslims, the intermediate one for Jews, and the highest one for Christians. Sir, if I may add just a note here. Can you relate to Muslim, theolo Sorry. Can you relate to Muslim theology as a problem in this context, or is it something, is there a possibility of reform? Can the Muslims consider changing their theological convictions in regard to this Question. In dealing with Islam, we have to think not only of theology, but also of law. I mean, uh, in, in Islam as in Judaism, the holy law 
is a central and important part of the religion. Um, all I can say is that uh, in the past, in various civilizations, jurists and theologians have shown astonishing powers of interpretation and reinterpretation. And I hope they'll be able to deal with this too. Though there's no immediate sign of it. Thank you very much. I will now exercise tolerance in the first meeting, <coughs> namely the rules that we impose. And that was the last question. Thank you very much.